Welcome back. I'm Dr. Ben Britton. Uh, this is uh, lecture three or section three of the Introduction to Electron Backscatter Diffraction uh, series. In this, we're going to look at how we form electron backscatter patterns uh, and how we capture uh, them within the microscope. So, uh, with that, if we just recall at this point, we hopefully have an appreciation perhaps that we're going to capture these diffraction patterns. These diffraction patterns are related to the crystal that is diffracting, uh, and effectively there are a series of uh, varying intensities across the diffraction pattern that are interesting, uh, and specifically that each of these bands constitutes a crystal plane within my crystal. So when we do the experiments, we do this in a scanning electron microscope where we form an electron beam that's a tightly focused probe of electrons, typically between five and say 30 kilo electron volts of potential. We introduce this into a sample that is well polished typically, and then it will diffract. So the electrons will go in, they will scatter, interact with the crystal. Some of those electrons will escape and they will scatter onto an imaging screen. And so in this example, we have a phosphor screen that is inserted in our microscope. We can have a series of other detectors. So in this example, we have an energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy experiment that we can simultaneously capture the data. So this geometry, we, we've seen this figure once before, but we have the electron beam that's introduced into the sample. It scatters from a diffracting plane subject to Bragg's law such that effectively we can have the center of the diffraction band and we can inscribe the band edges by the two theta relationship that is related to the plane spacing and the electron energy of the crystal. And therefore, as we rotate the crystal, the bands will move across the screen. There is some geometry that's important with regards to the detector distance that will change effectively, for instance, how wide this band will present on the screen. So if we move the sample closer to the, de uh, the uh, detector, closer to the sample, we'll see that effectively the band width will look narrower. As we move the detector backwards, it will look wider. If we extend this into considering what happens for that simple trajectory analysis, but we now have that this center line is the plane trace. So effectively, it's the plane that contains the perpendicular to the plane normal vector and the source point position. As we inscribe this in three dimensions, we can spin around and be contained within that plane to get the center band. And we have the separation of the band effectively as the two theta for this characteristic plane normal, the blue vector that's shown, uh, sorry, the, the, um, uh, for this one, sorry, it's the, the, the blackish vector, blackish blue vector that's shown here. Now, as I effectively do this across multiple diffracting planes, I can build up effectively a diffraction sphere that contains multiple projections of the crystal planes. Each of those bands that are inscribed on the sphere correspond to a specific diffracting plane. In the kinematical approximation, this is what we'll see a bit later, broadly the intensity is a function of the uh, scattering uh, structure factor for this crystal. So we can see this, that we have a crystal. If we have a particular orientation of that crystal, it will create a characteristic diffraction sphere. And then we insert a detector to get a projection of this diffraction sphere that we call the gnomic projection. That is effectively how a flat, fla flat plane samples a sphere. And this gives rise, us, gives rise to bands of raised intensity um, that are present. And the center of those bands is each of the diffracting planes that are present in the material. Uh, we can see that the gnomic projection in the uh, effectively non-gnomic projection, we would get sort of curvy bands. In the gnomic projection, the center lines are straight, but the edges are hyperbole. That's effectively due to the conic sections that are formed uh, due to the edges of those diffracting bands. So this is now showing us in the conventional EBSD, we have the electron beam, we have the formation of our characteristic uh, diffraction cone, this is the cosal cone that's present. This effectively is separated by two theta from the center line, or theta from each side of the center line, so two theta in width. This gives rise to our bands of raised intensity. So we see that this is effectively our crystal plane that's described as the center line with a particular bandwidth. 
we have a characteristic point on our screen that is the shortest distance between the screen and our sample. That is what we call the source point position or the pattern center. There is a detected distance that's involved that we've discussed briefly. Um, we will also get effectively there will be characteristic zone axes. That is effectively the intersection of uh, different planes, i.e. a direction in our crystal. Broadly, you can work that out as the cross product of two planes. That will give rise to the sheaf line that is the zone axis. There is another feature we won't spend too much time on, but there's something called the higher order Lowry zone ring, which is the holes ring uh, that can be useful for certain things, such as uh, lattice parameter measurements in certain crystal systems in here. One important aspect for the EBSD experiment, as compared to capturing a Kikuchi pattern in the TEM, is that we have a very short camera length, so we subtend a very large angle. Often it's 90 degrees or greater, and that enables us to see lots of the diffraction space. Uh, and that is very useful when we want to effectively characteristically determine the crystal orientation or the cr crystal phase that's present. The pattern formation itself, uh, they don't all look this pretty. Uh, more formally, the raw pattern uh, contains effectively an anisotropic diffuse background. Uh, that's from backscatter and other events. Uh, and we effectively have the raw pattern that is then a modulation of the background, i.e. we have multiplied the background to give us our bands of raised intensity. So if we can capture a nice background to flat field our image, we can divide our raw pattern by our background to get a beautiful recorded pattern. This is a silicon crystal, one of the best diffraction patterns you will see. We'll see it a few times. Uh, we can see here that there is effectively some fun that's happening at the zone axes. We can see higher order reflections that are present in the characteristic bands that are here. In practice, I just note that you can grab a background from an amorphous region, so we can sum across sort of multiple crystal orientations to this. We could perhaps rotate the crystal while we capture the background to sort of sum and smooth out uh, any characteristic diffraction features. Or we can go across multiple grains. So if we go at low magnification, we can get many grain images. Um, the background is formed broadly from effectively lots of many inelastic scattering events, so there's a variation in energy spread for the electrons that form this background itself. Just to recap for diffraction theory, so the kinematic diffraction theory says effectively that information or uh, within the band, we could describe effectively that related to the total intensity of scattering of that crystal plane series. Uh, and so we get effectively a good diffraction or strong diffraction gives you a bright band. Now, if we think about that and we sum at a zone axis, the kinematic solution breaks down because you're summing across multiple intersecting bands. What will happen more specifically is it will sort of rattle down the specific uh, sort of highly symmetric uh, crystal zone axis. You're kind of like in a pinball machine, I imagine it. And so you get some more funky effects that will happen that can be better described in uh, many beam dynamical calculations in here. But importantly, the kinematic solution is very useful as it does give us the geometry of where the bands are expected to be located across our crystal for a particular crystal uh, type and a particular crystal orientation. So the uh, if we go beyond the kinematic solutions, we can use a dynamical theory where especially in these simulations, what we do is we calculate what is the uh, what is happening for this pixel in our detector with respect to the incoming electron plane wave. So we will get scattering, we will get diffraction, we will get effectively uh, uh, diffraction events happening in our crystal that will give rise to a modulation uh, of the signal that's output, and that's the sort of dynamical simulation that's shown uh, on the right here. Uh, this is an experimental pattern uh, that I captured that effectively shows that we have reproduction very nicely of, for instance, the, the very fine structure around the zone axis, as well as, say, higher order features that are present in the simulation and the experiment. If you have uh, some uh, very good detector and very good imaging, you can get some higher order physics problems. So there's some path length issues that are located uh, around here. We'll discuss briefly a few of those points a bit later in the formation point. So the uh, uh, dynamical diffraction theory is very well described in the literature now, and there are tools to do these simulations relatively easily. 
Uh, the best place to find this is chapter three by Emil Winkelmann uh, and uh, his associated stack of papers on this. So effectively what we're going to do is we're going to understand the uh, variation in the diffraction probability distributions for each point or diffraction vector in our diffraction uh, camera. To do this, we use the principle of reciprocity that's present. And so effectively we say that we would like to know how the crystal produces the diffraction pattern at the specific diffraction pixel. We can do the reciprocal of that and say if we started with a plane wave at the diffracting uh, image pixel, how has it come from our crystal? This is a much simpler calculation because we then look at how the plane wave intersects with the orientation of the crystal and how effectively this results from the uh, near elastic recoil uh, of the electrons from the nucleus of each of our atoms that are present in our material. And that gives rise to the constructive and destructive interference in the many beam uh, calculations that are present. So we formally, we solve the variations in crystal potential that are experienced for the incoming plane waves for each of the different trajectories that are described in our diffraction pattern. Uh, and this nice nine beam calculation shows effectively how we change the experience or the angle of the potential wave with respect to position A that gives rise to our dark edge and position B that gives us our bright center. And so as we scan from B to A, we'll see that we change the inclination of angle of our plane wave with respect to our crystal. Uh, and this can be seen similarly for points C and D. Uh, and we can see that the funky patterns that happen towards the zone axis, and now as I described that sort of pinball machine type problem where you get much higher order effects that are happening as you rattle down the highly symmetric zone axes. Uh, I've sort of butchered the beautiful theories that are shown in Amo's papers, so please do have a look at his uh, thesis chapter, uh, his chapter, sorry, uh, and his papers on this if you are interested. Uh, this can be important for certain analyses methods. So one important aspect is in the EBSD experiment, the sample is highly inclined. We have the incoming highly focused probe of uh, electrons that are near the primary beam energy. These electrons will go into the sample, they will do scattering. Uh, we will effectively get the diffraction from the last events that happen, and it's effectively from very near the primary energy. So it's effectively uh, relatively um, uh, near the primary energy of this, this problem. Do note that in this highly tilted configuration, to encourage the escape of electrons, we effectively get an elongation of the interaction volume, such that the resolution is about three times worse down the tilt axis than it is along the tilt axis. That's important. The, uh, effectively, we have backscatter electrons typically that form our EBSD patterns, and they typically have only lost, say, a few to, say, maybe one kilo electron volt. We'll see some measurements of that a bit later. And they form typically from the top, say, 20 nanometers of our sample. Uh, the spatial resolution we'll see a bit later depends on the brilliance of the source. For a FEGSEM uh, in the X direction, this is about 20 to 100 nanometers, uh, depending on, of course, also the uh, effective density of the material. So a highly a, a dense material will have a, a finer um, interaction volume, uh, i.e. a better spatial resolution in a high Z number material. Uh, I just draw one attention point that because we subtend a very large angle, uh, and we subtend this across this very large angle, it changes the electron trajectories. Uh, and uh, we've done some measurements. Uh, there's a, a lot of discussion of this uh, in uh, AMO uh, Gert in my paper, where we discuss effectively the variation in energy intensity as we move down the diffraction pattern. There is a slight decrease from the primary energy, but it's typically about one kilo electron volt. So it doesn't hugely change the position of the Bragg angle, which is somewhere around the point of inflection of this sort of band trace. Uh, so the blue is effectively the bottom part of this pattern, uh, and the black is the top. Uh, broadly, it's very close to the primary beam. This is a 15 kilo electron volt probe, um, but there's a very slight change in the bandwidth uh, it's, uh, the, from this. But it's, it's close to the primary beam energy of this case. Um, this is uh, important for some of the finer analyses. Uh, this is because effectively the diffraction pattern itself, unlike the background, the diffraction is from the near elastic recoil, uh, with the nucleus, 
the energy loss is dependent a little bit on the path length and so that gives us some variations as we move down the pattern. Uh, it's most likely best described by a differential inverse elastic mean free path calculation. Uh, this is different to the uh, continuous slowing down approximation that you may have seen uh, if you've used something like Casino Monte Carlo simulations. But very briefly, there's a similar energy across the entire pattern with some subtle details. If you start to need to know that, uh, it can be important. I draw you to this FISREF B paper for some more discussions on that. Once we form the diffraction pattern, we have to capture the pattern uh, broadly in a conventional detector. We will effectively have the camera that is set up as some uh, scintillator that is scintillating, converting the electrons into light. That will go through some optical coupling and that will go to a sort of an electronic camera. Um, sort of many systems are based upon charge couple devices. Uh, some of the newer systems and faster systems can be based upon CMOS devices. This depends on the speed, cost, signals, noise, and imaging modes that you have available and some electronics. Uh, these details, again, I flag as a signposting. The, uh, the camera itself, the electronic chip, can be optically coupled either through a lens-based system or a fiber optic system, uh, and that's important when we consider the dynamic, uh, the, uh, dynamic quantum efficiency of this case, the DQE, uh, and that's also important with regards to gain and optical distortions that are present. In a phosphor-based system, uh, it will depend, of course, on who you've bought it from, but often it's a P20 or P43 phosphor uh, in the system. That's uh, principally due to response time, uh, as well as the efficiency of generation of light from the characteristic energy of electrons that we've got. We will typically put an aluminium-thin coating on the surface. This is extremely delicate, so do not touch it with anything you will damage. These phosphors typically cost about 1,000 to 2,000 pounds each, so you've got to be super careful not to damage the phosphor with time. Uh, the aluminium coating reduces charge on the phosphor and stops effectively buildup of charge in the system, which can cause issues with the electron microscope. Uh, the phosphor, as we'll see a bit later, has some voltage sensitivity. Broadly, there is a higher yield of photons uh, and lower exposure times when you have greater than, say, 15 kilo electron volts uh, of uh, incoming electrons onto the detector. One other aspect in the detector system is that the pattern center, I describe that as the shortest distance between the sample and the detector. This is a good pattern that has good contrast at the bottom and top of the image. So this is after background correction, it has strong contrast, we can see lots of bands and higher order features and sharpness towards the edge as well as towards the center. If you have the pattern center too high, it's somewhere over here in this example, we can see that we lose contrast and we also get some weird physics. To correct this, we would move the sample down in the chamber or we can move the detector upwards if you have that opportunity. The specific contrast setup is dependent on the Z number because that's effectively where it will scatter um, uh, and so do bear that in mind if you change material systems you may have to change your recipe. It will also vary the working distance is relatively easy to change um, and it's also microscope dependent on the physical how the ports are set up on that system. If you've got your nice pattern one of the things you can do to sort of increase uh, the signal to noise in the diffraction pattern is we can effectively use a process called pattern binning or we can effectively reduce the number of effective pixels in the detector. So if we've got a detector, a sort of high resolution detector we call them, say a 1600 by 1200 CCD, effectively we could say that each CCD signal, each little detector in that could be one well that we're counting the charge as this builds up uh, over time. At full resolution it would be 1600 by 1200 pixels. Let's just assume that there are effectively 10 electrons per image pixel being captured. Now if we take a cluster of 2 pixels by 2 pixels and sum the signal in that area, we now effectively reduce the number of pixels in the detector to 800 by 600. We have done what's called a 2 by 2 binning operation in the uh, detector, but now we effectively have 40 electrons per image pixel. So to get a high signal to noise, we can count for less time. We note, however, that the angle subtended per superpixel is decreasing. So we're going to sort of decrease the, what we could describe across our bands uh, in the measurements.
we could go to 4x4 binning and we can go up to effectively 10x10 binning on many of our systems to reduce the image size but effectively increase the electrons per image pixel or conversely you could effectively count for in this case an eighth of the time to get the same number of electrons per image pixel thereabouts in here. So the uh, higher image pixel number gives you more angular resolution in the pattern. The uh, higher amount of binning gives you more signal per pixel. There are also methods to do uh, to change the system, and we have uh, we're developing a, a number of groups, including my own. Uh, we're looking at uh, using direct electron detectors of different varieties. Some early work was on CMOS-based detectors. Uh, some more recent work is using Medipix-based detectors, where we can start to see higher acuity, uh, as described in sort of the Fourier transform to show sharp features in the image. Uh, and we can see, for instance, there are presence of higher order features within uh, the CMOS that you can't see in the phosphor due to effectively changes in the modulation transfer function. Uh, this is an emerging space. Uh, I suspect this, this figure may change if I give this lecture next year uh, significantly. So with that point, hopefully I've given you an idea of how we have uh, generated the signal and how we have captured the signal. Uh, in the next part, uh, section four, we're going to look at uh, how we index a diffraction pattern.